have two scripture lessons for you from today. The first is found in the 24th chapter of Luke, and it's the 44th through 53rd verses. Let us give uh, ear to the word of the Lord. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, from the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from dead on the third day. And a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Look, I am sending to you what my father promised, but you are to stay in the city until you have been furnished with this power. He, lifted, he led them out as far as Bethany, where he lifted his hands and blessed them. And as he blessed them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem overwhelmed with joy. And they were continuously in the temple praising God. And our second lesson is found in the book of Acts, the first chapter, the first through eleventh verses. Luke writes, Theophilus, the first scroll I wrote concerned everything Jesus did and taught from the beginning right up to the day when he was taken up into heaven. Before he was taking up, working in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus instructed the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, suffering, he showed them that he was alive with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to them about God's kingdom. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me, John baptized with water, but in only a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has set up by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when it has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going away, and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And Grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I like to sit and wonder sometimes, and that's not the official job description of a pastor, but sometimes it does seem appropriate just for me to sit there and ponder things. And in the last week, with the start of my class on mission, and in light of a recent study put out by the Pew Research Center, I've been thinking and wondering a lot, especially about what we're doing here at IV Memorial, in the United Methodist Church, and in particular, the Christian Church Universal. Perhaps you're not aware of the results of the study just released by the Pew Center. It was in the news recently. In a nutshell, their research said that in the last seven years, the United States has become a significantly less Christian country. The survey of 35,000 adults stated that while Christianity still dominates the American religious identity, there has been a dramatic shift as more people move away from the denominations and churches they have long been associated with. At the same time, the number of atheists, those who do not believe in deities, and agnostics, those who neither claim faith nor a disbelief in God, has nearly doubled. The study found that the percentage of people who describe themselves as Christians fell about eight points, from 78.4 to 70.6. 
This includes people in virtually all demographic groups, whether they are nearing retirement or just entering adulthood, married or single, living in the West or in the Bible Belt. In addition, members of the Southern Baptist Conference and the United Methodist Church, the country's two largest Protestant denominations, each dropped nearly one and a half percent. More troubling, perhaps, is the fact that nearly 86% of Americans that say they grew up as Christians, nearly one in five of them, 19%, say that they aren't so anymore. Now, those people consider themselves to be the N-O-N-E-S's, or the nuns that you may have heard about, those that are affiliated with no specific branch of Christianity. This group makes up 22.8% second only to evangelicals. Today in our country there are more nuns than members of the United Methodist, the Evangelical Lutheran, and the Episcopalian churches combined. And of that 22.8%, 15.8% don't even commit to any view on God. Instead they say they believe nothing in particular. Now, I know that that is a bunch of numbers just to throw at you, and if you're like me, it can be a little overwhelming. But our United Methodist Church Bishop Ken Carter of the Florida Conference, and he's a former member of our conference, has said that there are three things that we can take away from this report that are most important. First, he wrote, we have clearly moved in most communities beyond a culture of church affiliation as conformity. A generation ago, it was acceptable and expected that one participated in the church in order to cultivate social, economic, and political relationships. The age of social conformity shaped cultural and congregational Christians, but lacked the capacity to disciple men and women into a convictional and practicing faith. Secondly, Bishop Carter believes that those people who no longer claim a Christian affiliation do so for two factors. We must first take responsibility. In the words of the confession, we, meaning all of us, have failed to be an obedient church. Christian churches are dying by self-inflicted wounds, he says. We do, not, we do harm to each other through our attitudes regarding our faith and how we live it out for all of those to see. And the second factor to our demise, he says, is the relentless critique of the church by academia, by film, television, drama, and music, which constantly belittles Christians. The third thing we can take away from the report, according to Bishop Carter, is the inherent flaw in the United Methodist Church's own Open Hearts, Open Mind, Open Doors campaign of a few years ago. This campaign, he writes, assumed that the nuns and the duns would flow into our spaces and find us to be tolerant and open-minded people. The research again suggests that this did not happen and is not likely to occur in the future. And that, Bishop Carter believes, leaves us with three questions to ponder as the church universal. Number one, can we give a proper burial to the church of social conformity, whether it would be marked by liberalism or conservative evangelicalism? Secondly, can we move from the self-loathing into God's future, one that is missional and experimental? Can we claim the affirmation voiced in our prayer that God might free us for joyful obedience? And thirdly, can we channel our resources, our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness toward community-based forms of making disciples who would transform, if not the world, then at least the neighborhoods in which we live? So as I sat pondering these questions over the last few days, I began to look at our scriptures for today, and I made an interesting discovery, which I'm about to share with you. Jesus made numerous appearances to his disciples and others during the intervening 40 days from his resurrection today to today's ascension into heaven. He needed to teach them more about their roles as apostles, those who would be going out and be sent forth to find repentance and forgiveness of sins in Christ's name among all the nations of the earth. 
In these verses, Jesus is spending his final moments with his disciples and preparing them for that time, really any second now, when he will no longer be with them. And one of the things that Jesus did was to open the scriptures to the disciples and let them clearly see for the first time the Missio Dei, Greek for God's mission. And therein lays the discovery that I made. You see, this book, this Bible, is not just a great story about the Jews and their lack of devotion to God, nor is it just a story about his son Jesus that came. This Bible is a missional document. It is God's blueprint of reconciliation. It is our marching orders to be a mission for God. From the very beginning, God spoke creation into existence. God's role was to be our loving Father. But then, after the fall, God's mission had to change. No longer could Yahweh simply enjoy His creation, but now He must focus on humankind's sin, the breach that it created, and a way to redeem God's people from their enslavement. God never intended for mankind to live the way it has, but since sin entered the world, God has worked faithfully through His chosen people, Israel, and then through God's Son, Jesus, to bring about reconciliation and to restore the world to its right order. In order to do this, God had to send His creation on a mission of their very own. First, God sends Abram in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And like a father to his children, God gave instructions that would lead them back to him. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. It says in Exodus 19, 5 through 6. But mankind was not able to remain faithful to God's commandments. So God then sent Jesus to the world to make atonement for his creation. And after Jesus' salvific action on the, on the cross and his resurrection, God continued to teach his disciples on how to work to redeem others by spreading the gospel. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 reflects this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And just in case Jesus' friends feel lost without him, God leaves behind an advocate to help guide them. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, we read today in Acts 1, 8. The receiving of God's Holy Spirit would not take place until the day of Pentecost, another ten days from Jesus' ascension, which traditionally was actually Thursday of this past week. God's mission continues to this day, and I believe many church denominations are missing the point of what mission truly is. God's mission is not about putting tails in the pews on Sunday morning, but instead on getting God's people more involved in God's work in the world. It is at that point that God's mission becomes our mission. Now, as I said, I spent a lot of time pondering this week, and I began to ponder this question, which led to others. And I would like you to ponder them with me and wrestle with these questions as well. What would have happened if the first disciples had not gone and shared what they had witnessed with others? What if instead of waiting those extra 10 days that, that Jesus just asked them to wait for the gift of Pentecost, they had chosen to go back to their previous lives and to head home? What if they said, well, Peter's the best speaker among us, he can go. He can be the one to proclaim the good news. 
God has not equipped the rest of us adequately for that work. We're tired and we're disappointed and scared, and so we quit. We're out of here. We're going home. Best of luck to you, Peter. The problem that we are having today, I believe, that leads our neighbors falling away from the faith is rooted to those exact questions. Have we not failed in our mission to witness for God to the entire world? Have we not simply skirted our duty to witness to others? Are we not leaving the work of the proclaiming the good news to the ends of the earth to all those that we call preacher? I venture to say that we are all guilty of this. And the end result is that too many people in this world are left struggling through their lives without ever hearing anything about who Jesus was and is. We spent a lot of time in class talking the other day about how we hate the fact that Christians in America are facing persecution from all sides. While the nation's leadership seems to be bending over backwards to make sure that our Muslim brothers are not discriminated against, we Christians find ourselves with less and less freedom to practice our religion. And after a lot of thought, we decided that maybe, just maybe, that was a good thing. Christianity has always had to fight to be heard amongst the voices of other religions and other gods. And when someone tries to take that freedom away, watch out. I don't know. Maybe we're just comfortable enough to think things will change for the better as we silently sit in our pews praying for one another. In the meantime... Our Christian brothers in other parts of the world are being killed for truly carrying out God's mission to save his people and for testifying about what they have experienced as followers of Jesus Christ. What will happen to our faith if we who claim to be followers of Christ and therefore children of God continue to be silent and do nothing, not even willing to share our basic witness with others? What will happen if we sit back and allow our ancient texts being held in the formerly safe churches in Iraq, Syria, Libya, Egypt, and other places to be destroyed by groups such as ISIS? What will happen if we as followers of Christ do not proclaim the good news he brings to such a hurting world? I'll tell you what will happen. The Christian faith will cease to exist. We must not let this happen. Not on our watch. Luke's gospel reminds us that the disciples are witnesses to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as such witnesses, it was their job to go and tell others all that they had seen. They bore witness to the fact that he is the promised Messiah. They experienced personally the power of God's redeeming love shown in Jesus. They received the divine blessing. Their eyes were opened to the truth of God. Jesus is for them personally Lord and Savior. They are to proclaim the good news that in Jesus Christ, the promises of God have been opened to all the people. On this Ascension Sunday, it is time for us to claim the same responsibilities of those first disciples. It is our job today, today, to share our witness with somebody, anybody. It is time today to talk about how we, as the disciples of Jesus, are called to give our witness by proclaiming the good news to the ends of the earth. It is our time today to give witness to the redeeming love that we have seen, felt, known, and experienced in Jesus Christ. It is not only up to me as your pastor to do this. Each one of us has a story to tell about why we call Jesus our Savior. Each of us has experienced the transforming power of God's love. Each of us has received the same blessing and power that the disciples did at Pentecost. Each of us is a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ and is called to proclaim that news to the ends of the earth. It is time for all of us to realize that the Missio Dei, God's mission, is our mission. In this, my dear brothers and sisters, we cannot.
fail. Amen. And now if you will stand.